Okay, good afternoon. And first of all, I just want to say that I'm delighted to be here. And thank you to William and his team for putting this together. Um, I've been so enthralled by all, all the other talks that I haven't really had a chance to think about much um, about what I'm going to talk to you about. I'll start off by just introducing myself. So my name is Anne McNamara. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Visualization at Texas A&M University, which is about two hours north of here in College Station. Um, I'm director of graduate programs there um, in the Department of Visualization, so it would be awful for me to come all the way down here to this audience and not mention our graduate programs. We have an MFA in visualization and an MS in visualization. And what's unique about our program is that um, half of the faculty are computer science from technical backgrounds and the other half are um, artists with MFAs from creative backgrounds. And we do have some hybrids, um, but the students are forced to be hybrids. So often they go work um, in California for the entertainment industry for companies that you all know and love like DreamWorks and Pixar and Disney. Um, but with this re-advent um, of AR and VR, a lot of our students are becoming very interested in how they can use these technologies and how they can advance the knowledge, particularly in you know, the human factors um, process. And we actually have another of our faculty here, two other of our faculty here today, sorry, um, that will be um, presenting a little bit later on. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you about is a research grant that I have from the National Science Foundation to do with eye tracking and mobile augmented reality. Um, and I don't think I really need to um, introduce mobile augmented reality to this audience, but I might need to talk a little bit about eye tracking. So has anybody ever encountered eye tracking before? A few people, you've been eye tracked, or you eye tracked other people? Both, okay, cool. So um, eye tracking allows us to monitor the eye movements of people, and it just gives you a little bit more insight into where people are looking in a scene, or at a scene, and where they, um, give most of their attention. Um, so eye trackers come in lots of different forms. Um, the one we're currently using is like this one here at the top that has two cameras, one for each eye, and it performs some image processing. Basically, you're recording the pupils. It performs some image processing to segment out the pupil. Um, you do some calibration between the screen area um, and the distance from the cameras and your eyes, and then you can from that, you can extrapolate the x, y position on the screen. Um, we're moving more towards wearables, um, so wearable eye tracker, where we can actually move around in a real environment rather than be tethered to the screen. Um, and what this gives you then is information about where people looked and when um, on a screen. So for example, as humans, we're very attuned to looking at faces. Um, so as you can see for this website, people looked a lot at the face, so this goes on a, a scale from red to green, where obviously red is the hottest and then green um, fades off. So um, the red spots are where people are looking in the screen. And this can help with a range of applications from, from web design to game design to even the question I just asked um, this gentleman about um, presenting data in your peripheral vision. So the reason that I'm um, trying to marry augmented reality, mobile augmented reality with eye tracking is that we all know that with mobile augmented reality, when we place virtual information over the real scene, it's very easy to quickly overpopulate the window that we're looking through when we use these mobile applications. So for example, if you're using your tablet, then if you put 100 labels on there, whether they're text or graphics, um, then you're quickly going to obscure your real scene. Um, so that's not going to be very productive. And then as we move to smaller and smaller devices, such as our phones or even wearable glasses, the scene real estate becomes a more valuable commodity, and we don't want to display all of the information. So these are just examples. Um, here's another kind of example. So you just hold up your device. I don't think I really need to describe this. Um, but as our devices get smaller and smaller, then this becomes a more important issue. So um, there's actually two research projects I'm going to talk about um, today. And the first one is to try to use eye tracking to help improve view management. And view management is just the term that we use to manage where we place the labels and when on the screen. And the second one is to take advantage of the fact that we can actually influence where people look in a scene and aid scene navigation through gaze direction techniques. And we'll come back on, onto that one later. 
So for view management, well, we all know we can place virtual information over um, real information in a scene. But I, as I already mentioned, this can quickly overpopulate um, the scene, and that means that the real objects are occluded, but also the labels, the very information that we're trying to parse, um, overlaps with each other and quickly becomes um, occluded. And of course, there are strategies to minimize this. You wouldn't just um, reveal all the information. Um, so this was, might be more what um, a um, strategy would look like rather than have all the information, you just have the most salient information. Um, and the same happens for when we're walking around. So there's lots of examples of this um, where we have more information than we're able to display on the screen. So the proposed strategy that we have is that we have people in um, an eye tracker and basically it records the um, position of your eyes and rather than display all the information we just display the information where the user is looking. So for example, if I had a tablet in here and I had all the virtual information of all your names appear above your head, then I might quickly fill up my, my tablet with names. Whereas if I just wanted to look at Meg over there um, and I could pair my um, eyes to just look at Meg, just Meg's information would appear. Um, so we um, started off looking at ways to try to do this. So here's kind of a quick mock-up. Um, we can break the space into quadrants. Um, and then here we have kind of all the available information. And then if we break our screen into different areas and we find that the eye track, can, the eyes are tracking here in this one um, quadrant, then we can just um, display that information. And even that small step gives us a lot cleaner information because now your view of the real scene is not occluded by all those unnecessary um, data labels. And what's nice about this approach um, is that the eye tracking doesn't have to be perfect, right? So eye tracking, um, different eye trackers can give you different accuracy and different resolution of where the pupil is in relation to the scene. And for this application, it's nice because you can just say that the um, the, if the eye is in a certain region, an area of interest, rather than in, at a certain pixel value, then you can um, trigger the virtual labels. Um, these are just other examples. So what we did to, to evaluate this was we ran a user study. Um, and to do this user study, what we did was we first presented the participants with all the available information for a scene and we had 10 different scenes and we just picked them from everyday scenes like a farmer's market or a used car lot and we had a cereal aisle in the grocery store um, we had a garden center with different plants and we asked people questions like how much is a pound of green peppers so they would have to locate the green peppers locate the label for the green peppers and then locate the price per pound for the green peppers and we might also ask them the the um, the origin, the, the country of origin, the, the state of origin, whatever information is embedded in your, in your scene. So this would be all the information. Um, and then we, we looked at existing strategies for view management, um, which would just um, give you some of the information. Um, and this was one that was actually, this was an eye tracking one. And it was based on um, spatial information. So if the eye point was within a certain range of this, then this label would be um, displayed. Um, and then, But also other labels in that region would be displayed at varying degrees of transparency. So we also had to think about how to um, present the labels in a fashion that was gracefully degraded. So if you had labels just pop up and disappear in the, in, instantaneously, then that's what's called a, like a Midas touch project or problem um, because the actual action of popping the labels um, in your vision causes you to look at them. So that would lead to something else. Okay. Um, so then this was, the, this was just the one with um, the eye tracking. Um, so we did this first on a desktop on a 22 inch screen. And we didn't find much differences between the, um, the case with all the labels and the case with just the, the um, eye tracking base or the gaze based labels. Um, and we think that that's because the screen was too big. So 
So then we gradually made the screen size smaller and we did it on the size of an iPad and the size of an iPhone. And as we made the screen size smaller, we found bigger gains in using this gaze-based approach. Um, so we've only managed to do this on the desktop so far. Our next step is to move this out into the real world. And we've actually ordered um, a new wearable eye tracker. And of course, they decided to change out their cameras in the meantime, and it's on delay. But um, our, next, um, our next goal is to take this out and actually run these experiments in the real world, where people are walking through scenes um, with a tablet or with an iPad and um, at the same time wearing an eye tracker um, so we can present the labels based on where they're looking in the screen. So that's kind of our first project. The second project is to know that we can, when we're looking at a real scene through a lens, we can do whatever we want to the information on the lens to either highlight regions or um, to make regions fade away and not be as interesting. So this was actually a project that stemmed from a conversation with an art historian in our department. And as I mentioned, what's kind of nice is that we have half technical people and half artistic people. So the collaborations um, are always really, really creative. And um, is anyone familiar with this painting? Good. Well, here's a little art history lesson then. Um, so this is what's called an episodic painting. And it's from the 15th century. And the artist is Caravaggio. And in those days, people would have known how to read this image. But we're used to now in Western culture anyway, to read from left to right and up to down. But if you look at this story, it's called um, Tribute Money. And basically, it's um, so let me tell you the story. So the tax collector comes and tells Jesus he owes taxes. Then Jesus tells Peter to go to the river and catch a coin from the mouth of a fish. Then if you look over here, here's Peter doing that action, taking the um, coin from the mouth of the fish. And then we go all the way over here, and there's Peter paying the tax collector. Right? So if you just look at this painting in general, you probably didn't notice that they're wear they're, the characters are wearing the same clothes. Right? That's how you kind of identify that. Um, here's your tax collector, and here he is over here. So the frames of the story are not in the same order as we would expect them. So what we thought we could do was use this ability for us to change the actual content of the images um, to draw attention to them. Um, so here's the story again, just the tax collector. He goes over to do the fish, and then he's back to the storage. Um, so before I had this conversation with the art historian, we had done some research um, on 2D images called subtle gaze direction. And based on the question I asked the presenter before, Christopher, um, what we realized was that our peripheral motion is very attuned to motion. So you know sometimes you think you see like a bug from the corner of your eye, and then you look and it's really nothing at all, or the bug has moved on. Um, well, we thought we could do that with images. So imagine this is your image, um, and this area is where I want the user to look. Well, I can do, and, and the user is now looking here at F. That's their fixation point where they're um, currently looking. So I want them to look over here. And this is in their peripheral vision. And I know this because I'm tracking their eye position. So if I do something over there, something really quick, something really subtle, then I can draw their gaze over there. And then if I, could, if I repeatedly do that, I can draw the gaze around the image. So you can kind of see how then we saw this as a good partner for the story in the previous slide with the art history. Um, we, we, oh, the other thing I didn't mention was that we would actually turn off the something we were doing, which was actually a really just a small luminance modulation in the image where we cycled it from um, black to white in, in the brightness channel. But basically, once because we were eye tracking, we knew when the person would move their eyes. And we have these rapid eye movements called saccades. So we knew when a saccade was triggered, and we could turn this off. So it's kind of like that bug when he goes missing, right? So when people started to look, you're essentially blind during these rapid eye movements called saccades. We would turn it off, and they never really knew why they looked over there. Okay, So that's why where the subtle comes in. 
Okay, so this is an example of results. We did a study, and we had about 25 images and 25 participants, and we asked them um, a question which wasn't really related to the um, related to the image at all, or what we were trying to do. We asked them what was the quality of the image, and they were all photographs of the same resolution, so they were all the same quality. And but we asked people um, just to see where they were looking in the image. So this is where people looked when they were just looking at the image, trying to figure out what they decided where the, was the quality. And of course, this is kind of where the action is. And as I already mentioned, we're attuned to looking at human faces. So um, you can see that most of the fixation time was spent looking at this face and around the action. OK, so then where these white crosses are, we placed those subtle modulations to see if we could draw people's gaze about the image. Um, and you can see that that's very different, a very different pattern of viewing than when the image was not disrupted at all. Okay, so we did this for a whole bunch of images and we showed that we could actually direct gaze around a 2D image. And here they all are together just so you can see them again. Um, so then the idea was to move this into a mobile augmented reality space. Um, so you have your iPad and you, you can walk into the gallery or you could look at it just as a print or whatever. And you hold up your iPad in front of it. And you can do things to the image at different times. You can barely see it on here. But things like change the brightness, change the dodge, change the contrast. Um, and so we ran some experiments doing that. Um, and this is just to show you that this is where people looked when there was no modulation on the image, when we didn't do anything to try to change it. Um, we changed the dodge on the image, and you can see that that changed the image significantly. So people would look, you know, in those regions we wanted them to look at the start of the story, over to the fish, and then back over to the um, when he pays the tax collector. And we did some Gaussian blur on the regions that were not um, important to the story. And again, you can see that the gaze followed the correct pattern. Um, we changed the contrast. So all of these are good candidates to allow us to direct gaze about the image. So we change the contrast. So just in this region, then in this region, and sequentially, according to how the story should be read. Um, we follow this up with some other experiments. Um, and I can give you pointers to those if you're interested. Um, but basically, we took a whole bunch of these episodic paintings. Um, and we, um, we had two groups of people. One group just looked at them. Um, you know, uh, unaltered. And the other group looked at them where we could um, guide them through the panels, if you like, um, using gaze direction. And then we asked people to lay out the panels in order of the story. And the people who had the gaze direction did significantly better at laying out the panels in the correct story order than people who did not have gaze direction. OK, so just some acknowledgments. Um, as I already mentioned, this um, work is supported by an NSF Career Award. Um, going forward, um, we're looking at not just um, use of the eye tracking in AR, but also in VR. And these are some of the, the um, hardware spaces that we're actually experimenting in at the moment. Um, because we feel like rather than have, rather than try to do this AR, mobile AR work in the real world, we could actually do it in a virtual environment and have more control over our stimuli. Um, so um, I hope that some of you have some interesting questions for me or feedback. Um, I'd be delighted to try to answer them. And thank you for your attention.